Good evening, everyone. I think we'll get started. Welcome, everybody. Delighted with such a, a wonderful Harvard Westlake crowd, excited about the Los Angeles Rams and about one of our very own who, of course, played a key role in making Los Angeles Ram excitement possible. My name is Rick Commons. I am in my third year as president at Harvard Westlake, and, uh, and it is a thrill to be here with all of you and, uh, and celebrating Kevin Demoff. I want to talk a little bit about the background here. As you know, one of the great privileges of teaching and working at Harvard Westlake School is the amazing students that we have. Talented, motivated, incredibly bright and, and, and ready and willing when they come to class. One of the additional privileges is watching when they leave Harvard Westlake, as many of you have done, to go and make a mark in the world. And certainly Kevin Demoff has made a mark in the world and in Los Angeles in bringing the Los Angeles Rams back to LA. After 20 years, they left in 1995, the year that Kevin graduated from Harvard Westlake. <laughs> and in those 20 years, while the Rams were away from Los Angeles, Kevin earned a BA and an MBA from Dartmouth. He worked for three years with the Los Angeles Avengers in the Arena Football League, three years with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. And then in 2008, he became the Chief Operating Officer and Executive Vice President at the St. Louis Rams. He also managed during that time to meet and marry his lovely wife, Jen, and they've got two children, Claire and Owen, and we are thrilled to have their family back in Los Angeles. I can tell you that that resume, while that's impressive to just about anybody, that swift rise, I think it became known to the world about a month and a half ago when Kevin made a presentation to 32 NFL owners who, as I understand it, were sitting back in 32 leather chairs, leaning back, and, uh, and Kevin gave a presentation to them about the LA Rams, which was, and I quote, one that blew them away. I think it also blew away the rather notable competition who was there, and uh, we, we shan't name names, but as I understand it, uh, that, that competition was also blown away. <laughs> it's, a, it's an exciting thing, as I say, of course, to, to have a chance to bring somebody back who's a Harvard Westlake graduate. I had the privilege of teaching Kevin when he was a sophomore, sophomore English, and then again when he was a senior. And I can tell you, at that time, he had tremendous ability, which was visible, and tremendous ambition, which was visible. I have a vivid recollection of when he was a sophomore, assigning a five-paragraph essay, I think it was on Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, <laughs> and Kevin came back with a topic which I tried to dissuade him from with the offhand comment that this would take 10 pages to do well, and th that's just too much for a sophomore, too much for you. And a few days later, this is a true story, Kevin came back with a 10-page essay, careful, compelling, convincing, and I think it's fair to say that I was blown away. Kevin, we are thrilled to have you back in Los Angeles. Welcome home to LA. Welcome home to Harvard Westlake. I turn it over to you, and thanks for being here. This is a little different than Houston. There were 32 of them. There are a lot of you. Um, and, and I already know this program, quote unquote, is full of shit because, <laughs> because Rick is my 10th grade teacher. He told you the story. What he didn't tell you is when I turned in that paper, he gave me a D. <laughs> and, and I actually vividly remember this because <laughs> he gave me a D. And he turned it back and he goes, there's no way you proofread this paper. <laughs> and I said, I spell checked it. And he said, spell checking is not proofreading. And sure enough, he goes, go back and proofread this and I might change your grade. I went back, I spell checked it again, he gave me another D. 
Finally, I proofread it and I got some other grade. But it is one of my vivid memories from Harvard Wesley came. And I can tell you, I proofread this presentation beyond belief. So it, it, the things that you learn in 10th grade, the things that you can learn from Rick Commons were fantastic. This is fun for me, and I hope it's a fun night for you. This is the first presentation the Rams have done back in Los Angeles. And, and I say that because <laughs> let's be honest, in my travels, I never thought I'd be back to Los Angeles, so I didn't donate a ton to Harvard Westlake. <laughs> And my wife and I looked at each other last year and we go, maybe we should up our gift just slightly in the off chance that we win. And we did that, but then we come to realize, oh my god, we have a third grader and a first grade. We only got three years to get our kids in. So <laughs> hence, welcome to our first presentation. <laughs> but this is going to be a, a fun night. And I tell you, this has been a, a tremendous process for all of those who have worked tonight. It's really two and a half years in the making to be sitting here talking about this today. And I can tell you, it is still very surreal for all of us to be talking about the Los Angeles Rams. And to be talking about bringing a football team, yes, for the, back for the first time uh, since I was a senior in high school. And to think about what that means for this community, and I look out at this room and I see a full room, and it is exemplary, but it's a response we have turned, received at every turn that we've gotten here since we have come back, since we announced January 12th. We've seen just such a tremendous outpouring for the NFL, from friends, from family, from strangers about the return of the Rams. So I'm going to do a little bit tonight. We're going to have fun. Please tell me we'll have fun. I know hopefully the bar is still open. You guys can get up <laughs> and go back and forth. We'll try to be short. But the presentation you see here is what we show the owners in Houston. Uh, it's going to be the first time we've shown it outside the room in Houston. So you'll get a little bit of a chance of that. I'll walk you through a little bit of the history of how this started, how this came to be, uh, a little bit of the backstory. Because it's on you know, webcast, I'll be a little bit guarded. In, in my comments, but if you come up afterwards, I'll, I'll tell you the unadulterated truth. Um, <laughs> as I said, there, it was a, a tremendous opportunity for the NFL, one that, that I was fortunate to work for Stan Kroenke, who had a tremendous vision in how he could bring the NFL back to Los Angeles and how we could solve this riddle of 20 years. But I'm going to start with a day where we all remember. And there are times in your life you remember where you get a phone call. Uh, where you were, what happened, what was going on. And it was the summer of 2013. We do training camp in St. Louis, and, and it, it's funny. When, when Rick said the St. Louis Rams, it's the first time I've heard that in a month and a half, and it still catches me off guard. But I was standing by my window in St. Louis. It was 7.15. Training camp starts early. It's long days. It's hot days. And I was standing looking out my window set up with the training camp set up, and my phone rang, and it said, unknown. And there's only one person in the world who comes up unknown on my phone, and it's Stan. And if you're getting a call from your boss at 7.15 and you know they're on the West Coast, either it's something really great or you're about to be fired. Right? It's one of the two. And, and I was standing by the window, and he said, I'm dry. it was 5.15 his time. He goes, I'm driving around Hollywood Park. This is an unbelievable sight. Do we think this could really happen? And he was driving around. It's what he does. And he's driving around in the dark. He's looking around. He's trying to get into the back by the barns because it's still an active racetrack at that point. We're on the phone for two hours. And he says, I think this could work. And that was the first time I ever thought this could become reality. Two and a half long years later, we're sitting here and presenting what happened and, and how it came to be. And it started off very slowly. That drive eventually became a late fall purchase in 2013 of the first 60 acres. And it's a parking lot. For those of you who've been in the forum, it's the one parking lot that's currently paved. It was part of track owned it for parking. It was owned by Walmart. It was eventually going to become a superstore. That didn't happen. And it was put up for sale a number of times. And Stan will tell you, if you listen to him talk about this process, that we got lucky a number of times. And the first time we got very lucky was they had sold it about a year earlier, and the sale fell through. And it went back up for sale. We were fortunate enough 
to be able to bid on it open blind process. Ironically, the better we were competing against was the NFL, which <laughs> was interesting to us in a number of times. And we'd ask them, we'd say, are you bidding on us? And they'd say, no, 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 we're not bidding on, on this. Now they take great pride in the fact that they were indeed bidding on the 60 acres. And we purchased that land in January of 2014. And that was really the first time you could start to see this coming to fruition. But the problem was 60 acres is not enough to build a stadium. As you look at modern stadiums, when you talk about stadiums, parking, and what it would take to get a great project done in Los Angeles, 60 acres wouldn't be enough. And so very quietly, we started to explore the other 240 acres at Hollywood Park that could be for sale that were owned by a group called Stockbridge, which was starting Hollywood Park tomorrow, would have been fully entitled. And so we began that process of trying to see, could we go acquire the additional 240 acres? Because originally 60 would be great, but it would merely be leverage. And if I take you back in time, we were fortunate in the sense that when the team was lured away from Los Angeles to St. Louis, it was with the promise that after every 10 years, we would have a first tier stadium in St. Louis, which meant that we would have the best of the best in the way it went. And at the end of 2013, uh, we went through a process arbitration-wise with the city of St. Louis where they declined to improve our stadium, which made us a free agent in March of 2015. So now for the first time, you had a free agent team that could look to move. And, and Los Angeles was an impossible riddle for the NFL because what it always took was a great project, a great owner, and then someone who could put it all together and the league. And the reason that it struggled to come to fruition was while there were always great third parties who were willing to build the stadium, there had to be enough money in the project for a third party real estate developer, the NFL, and the team. And that had never come to fruition in any form. So if you look at Farmer's Field, which is probably the closest, you still had AEG, you needed a team, and then you had to have the NFL, which always was expecting a payout at the end of the day. I don't think we ever thought it would be as much as we eventually paid. <laughs> <laughs> but they, they were expecting a payout. And so at the same time, we, we actually did a meeting with Farmers Field. Uh, we listened to their project, and we just decided, you know, we don't think that this is for us. And, and there were a number of reasons for that. But we didn't think it was the perfect location you know, for the team. But we started to figure out there was no way in Los Angeles you were going to get a project off the ground in the city of Los Angeles with Farmers Field still being a viable option. There was just the political opposition would be way too much. And so you started to look for what the alternatives could be. We found this 60 acres. And so in April of 2014, we were essentially be able to start to piece together what this project could look like, partnering with Stockbridge to acquire the remainder of the 238 acres they owned and now have 298 acres. And so essentially, you were starting to see this come to to fruition before your eyes. And I remember the first meeting we ever did, and this is the part of the process where you ultimately, I look back and laugh. And in the summer of 2014, we did a meeting in Denver, which involved uh, myself and Stan, uh, a group from Wilson Meany, who, who oversaw the Hollywood Park Tomorrow project that we inherited, Stockbridge, which sold us the land. Uh, and I met many of you here talked about Gibson Dunn and Amy Forbes, so Amy was there as part of that meeting. Uh, and our architects from HKS, who we had worked with before in St. Louis, who we brought stealthily in this project. And for the first time, we assembled a group and said, we have 298 acres and we want to build a football stadium. How the hell are we going to do this? And everybody went around the room and they talked about what their role was going to be. Wilson Meany was going to help us get entitled in Englewood. HKS was going to design the stadium. Stockbridge was going to help us figure out how we would help pay for all of this. Stan said he bought the land and they turned to me and I said, I'm the person who hopefully, if we get this to fruition, will get 24 owners to raise their right hand and say yes to being back in Los Angeles. That seemed like a really easy thing at the time <laughs> because everybody else had to go design a stadium, design the land, design the plot, and all I had to do was go present it. And what is fascinating is I stand here today and when I stood in Houston and every other owner's meeting, there were 200 people who worked tirelessly to make this project come to life. I was just happy to be the storyteller at the end who had a terrific project, a terrific vision. But there's something that, that Stan said that day that resonated with us all and we still talk about, even as we have another meeting in Denver on tomorrow on how the hell we're going to go build this thing. But it was, do not undersell this opportunity. You only get one chance to go back to Los Angeles. You only get one chance to do it right. 
And that became our motto for the remaining two years of, of how we went forward and worked on this project tirelessly to deliver what you're going to see. And what you're going to see, and the reason in Los Angeles, is solely because Stan was the first person to unlock those three keys. For the first time, there was not a third party real estate developer, a team in the league. It was just the team in the league. He was the first person to have the team, have the real estate acumen and get it done, pair those two, and then we could go to the league and say, this is what we can do for you. And as excited about the league was bringing the team back to Los Angeles, they did not make this process easy, nor should it be. To relocate a team should be very hard, and it was extraordinarily hard. And it's something that you could only look at for this opportunity, for what this could ultimately become in Los Angeles. So late in the summer of 2014, we started to envision whether this could be possible, whether we could make this happen. And we started off by going through and figuring out what you're going to do with 300 acres. How are you going to make this a transformative project? Because the NFL in Los Angeles, Los Angeles is a terrific city, but it's been without the NFL for 20 years and seems to have done just fine <laughs> looking by the attendance in this room and everything else that's happened. How do you make it relevant and again that a city that already has eight professional sports teams and two major universities? It had to be something bigger than the NFL. It had to be transformative for a community such as Englewood, and it had to piece together elements that hadn't come together before. And I will say LA Live came very close. When you looked at that model, you could see what they were on the cusp of. It was just overdeveloped to that point and really was trying to shoehorn in a stadium versus having a stadium at the center of what you were going to have a heart of. So we started with Wilson Mino developers of how do we create a great campus? How do we create something that transcends the NFL? So if we're playing 10 Sundays a year, if a second team is playing another 10 Sundays a year, how do we activate this 345 other days a year to make it meaningful in the Los Angeles landscape? So people think of this as something bigger than just the return of the NFL. They look at this as a project that's terrific for Los Angeles. And we went to work on that for months and months. And in their vivid memories of sitting in these meetings working on them, one of them I remember uh, was the day after Sam Bradford tore his ACL for the second time in Cleveland. Doctors told me the news that next morning. I jumped on a plane. We went to San Francisco and we were talking about, all right, how do we go develop a stadium? I'm like, I need anything else because our season's about to be a train wreck. And if we can focus on something else, that would be great. <laughs> <laughs> we got to do, the season was a train wreck, <laughs> and, and we got to go focus on something else. In September, the league started to figure out that this could really be a project and it could be something, and so they started to put together what they called their LA Ad Hoc Committee, which started out with uh, a monthly phone call between the NFL, uh, their league staff, and then two owners at the time, which was Art Rooney of the Steelers, who was chairman the stadium committee and Bob McNair who was chairman of the finance committee. We would do these conference calls and we would talk to them about the Inglewood project and what we were doing and how it was going to come together. But we did that in September, we did it in October and all of a sudden it's now November of 2014 and we're sitting there trying to think of how do we convince that the NFL that this project is real. That this is really what they've waited 20 years to come back for. And so we sat and we scratched our heads and we talked about doing a presentation which was the first presentation. There was a meeting in Atlanta uh, at the Ritz-Carlton in, in Buckhead that we all went to. And we basically sat down. They invited the Chargers, the Raiders, and us to go present kind of where we were. And we figured this was our first real chance to show where we were at. And we had been very fortunate. We had been working on this project for a while. And in August of 2014, and I don't know how many of you are real estate people. I don't really want to know. <laughs> Um, we are looking for land to build a practice facility. If you do have land, <laughs> 30 plus acres, please come up after and we'll, we'll be happy to talk. But in, in the sense of, in, in the sense of uh, what we were trying to do, you know, we were fortunate that it is impossible to get anything built in California. And, and I think when you look back at Farmer's Field, one of the great advantages they had is they had worked with Sacramento, they had worked with the city of Los Angeles, they got fully entitled in their environmental review very quickly. And we knew if we were going to try to present this to the owners you know, for a relocation, that you had to have all that done. And we were fortunate in 2014 there was a Supreme Court case uh, in California, the Tuolumne case, which basically said you could go through an initiative process and the city council or voters could take it on their own hands in smaller communities and basically go through a city council and get things approved. And so all of a sudden, you now had a path that if you could get an initiative passed in Inglewood, 
but all of a sudden the city council could vote and that changed the dynamics of what we're looking at because we we're always looking at having to go get a vote of the people and getting anything a vote of the people we always figured was impossible no matter how excited they were no matter what we thought the process would be getting more than 50 percent of an electorate in any city in california to come vote for a large project has difficult and even more so it invites opposition who can come in and oppose you for whatever project you want to do so we walked into atlanta knowing that we could try an entitlement path that was different that we could basically partner with the inglewood city council but what's unusual is to do that you can't have any conversations with the city council or the government. So you're basically working on this project on your own and you're gonna unveil it at some point at which you could basically go and say, here's a fully baked project which we expect you to support and help us deliver. And so that process began with the NFL and it was November 16th, 2014, we met in Atlanta. And for the first time we said, here's everything we're doing. And our goal was to show how much work we had done. This group of 200 people that was working every day and what we did is we put together a video to show the NFL, uh, which has now become, we've shown a number of times throughout, it's grown each time. What you're gonna see today is the final version that we have now, now that we're approved, but it's also basically the same video we showed that got us underway in November of 2014. So if we can show the video, uh, we'll be happy. <coughs> Show it again. <laughs> I've seen it probably 500 times. So. <laughs> when we showed that video in Atlanta, I remember an owner who shall be nameless turning around, looking at Stan, and saying, That's when I first thought we had a chance to actually pull this off. And when he started to envision what it could become. And so, we sat there and the league said, how quickly can you get this done? How quickly can you be entitled? And at that time we thought June of 2015 and they said, can you be faster? Can you go by the spring meeting in March of 2015? And we said, sure, just money, right? <laughs> so, so we kind of regrouped and we, we worked on that and then sure enough it came back. Two weeks later they called and they said, okay, nobody can apply for, for 2015, so, so stand down. And they told us two things, they said, you can't apply for 2015, and you can't make any public declaration by before January 1st. And we said, well, good news and bad news, we can do that, but 
we've now started this process that we can't undo in Inglewood, and you know, we're going to basically announce this initiative January so we can start a vote to get entitled. And, and so really we began that process. So January 5th uh, of 2015, we announced uh, this project in the LA Times in Englewood. And the, the other unsung hero on this, he's not a Harvard West Lake alum, but Sam Farmer came. So what, Sam, you get to stand up and wave your hand. <laughs> I, I, Sam and I have worked long and hard, and we spent a whole weekend, that first weekend, I was at my daughter's swim practice when Sam called and he said, I hear you may have a story for me uh, for Monday. And I said, I might. And I said, but, he said, I'm at swim practice, can I call you later? And, and you have to understand, I lived in fear for a long time when Sam Farmer would pop up on my cell phone <laughs> that he would say, I know exactly what you're doing, and I'm writing about it. And so finally, the fact that we were able to actually break the story on, on January 5th and, and be on the front page and control the message and begin that process in Inglewood, and it wound up being a very smooth process, despite all of our fears about going through the initiative. Uh, before we announced, uh, we had done internal polling in Inglewood that showed us probably around 80% of the residents would want this project. Eventually, it became close to 100%. We gathered, we needed 12,000 signatures uh, within a 30-day period we got 15,000 in the first basically eight days. And so we were able to go through that process. Somehow we got over about 25,000 and only, then they had to go count those signatures, make sure they were verified, which they did. And then on February 25th of 2015, our project was entitled and approved, which would have been great except for the small hiccup that on February 21st, uh, two other teams announced another project uh, that was coming aboard in Carson. And again, Sam can tell you, because we were there, I, we were at dinner at the Combine in St. Elmo's in Indy. Uh, we were having a nice chat. I was with a bunch of agents working on a deal, and Sam texts me, he goes, I need to talk to you. And I come up, I see him, and he goes, they're announcing a project in Carson. We knew very well that the Chargers had been working in Carson on, on a similar project, uh, that they have been going through the process, and that something was in the works, but we did not know what. And, and when they paired up with the Raiders, you started to understand the gravity of what was going to become a, a very interesting race uh, that would define our 2015. But you continue to work hard. You continue to go through the process and build the best possible project you could. And our focal point was no different than that summer of 2014 meeting. You had to come up with a project that the NFL just couldn't say no to. And that's really what our focus was the whole time. It didn't matter that the Rams had been here 49 years. It didn't matter that we were first to the gate in announcing the project or that we had this great piece of land on the west side. It had to be something that was truly special and would redefine the NFL and would redefine Los Angeles. And we always figured that would carry the day. And we really worked through all of 2015 to define that project. Uh, we had a number of meetings with the NFL in March, in April, and June. We started to do meetings. There was the Committee on Los Angeles Opportunities which was formed, we would meet with them every month. we present where we were, and we would basically walk through that process. And it was a, a grueling process, again, it should be, to relocate a team and what we're moving forward with. What was very interesting you know, in this process, if you go back in time, in January of 2014, we announced we had bought 60 acres of land. And all of a sudden, St. Louis asked, you know, what are you guys up to? And it was, you know, we were trying to say, you know, we had been through this process and we expected them to come back with a proposal. Uh, it was not until two days after the Atlanta meeting where we'd show that video where we did our first meeting with the city of St. Louis where they started to outline where they were. So I think you can begin to understand how far down the road we were with Los Angeles really until St. Louis, you know, came into the fold. And I give St. Louis, and I won't spend a lot of time, a ton of credit for the efforts they came up with in trying to keep the team and looking at the stadium, unfortunately, as we always said, this is really late in the process to begin to unwind some of the things that we've done. And this is such a terrific opportunity for the NFL and for the Rams that, that we have to explore it. The first real time, and you'll see some of this in the presentation, in August of 2015, there was a summit uh, in Chicago where they invited the 32 owners to come and hear the two projects, Carson and Englewood, really for the first time, which was the first time we presented. And you know, basically, that was the dog and pony show that you thought would kick it off. In hindsight, I don't know how important that meeting actually was when you go back and look, because we did a lot of the same presentation you're about to see in Chicago, 
and it was not as memorable, it seems, as then. But you have to remember, it was such a long time away that I think the owners kind of walked away <laughs> saying, this is pie in the sky. This isn't going to happen anytime soon. The vote is not for another six months. And they kind of walked away looking at both projects. And I thought we had a very good day in Chicago. I thought our presentation was meaningful and set the stage. But it was not, at the end, the be all and end all. And then we went through the entire fall process of trying to convince the owners of where we stood, what this project would mean for the NFL and for Los Angeles in particular, and the opportunity that, that was in front of us. And all of a sudden, you know, things were coming upon us pretty quickly. A relocation application was due the first week in January. Uh, either thankfully or not thankfully, we went on a four-game losing streak in the middle of November. So we went from being in the playoff hunt and, and having a seed to being woefully out of the playoff hunt, which allowed us a little more time to, to talk about this and, and to put things together. But December was trying to furiously come up with, they announced that there was going to be a presentation in Houston. And, and the one thing that I never thought about this project as we went through this is I always thought that this would be a brokered outcome. At some point, the NFL would, would sit everybody down in a room and say, look, we like the Inglewood project. We really think the Chargers and Rams are great candidates. You two go figure it out. And I think everybody who was around this process for a very long time thought at some point in 2015 that that, that conversation would happen. But it never did. I think it came close a number of times. For whatever reason, it never came to fruition. So the one thing that nobody who was ever involved in this process thought would happen was essentially a one-day winner-take-all project in Houston. And I, I, to this day, I'm still amazed that it essentially came down to that. But what happened was, while the Houston presentation was very important, uh, the week before in New York, they gathered three committees. It was the Finance Committee, the Stadium Committee, and the Committee on LA Opportunities, which eventually represented about half of the owners in the NFL. And we gave a version of this presentation to that room and basically walk them through why we thought you know, we'd have a really good opportunity in Los Angeles, why we were the right project. And it was at that first time that I started to envision that we could actually win this. And just by the attitude in the room, what we presented, and how it went, you could see that they were starting to understand the opportunity for the entire NFL that our project represented. We then stayed behind. They asked us to stay overnight. The presentation was on a Wednesday. Uh, they asked us to stay overnight Thursday and to really work with them on what a potential second team opportunity could be a, as a partner in our stadium. We then Thursday turned into Friday. We ran out of clothes. Um, it, we got locked in a room essentially in the NFL for, for 48 hours and hammered out the agreement that eventually came to be the agreement in Houston that, that got voted upon. And it was only then that you could really start to envision what this could mean, that this could come to reality and we still had to go to, to Houston and deliver it. But I, I remember walking out of that meeting with Stan and looking at him and saying, I, I think we're close. And, and I think we're, but we needed to have a great day in Houston. And there's been a lot made, there was a lot written on this subject for the past year. And much of it centered around how many votes each side had and, and who stood where. And you needed 24 votes to win. And, and really, by our math, throughout 2015, we had about 10 solid votes. We thought they had about 10 solid votes. And the remainder of the league we thought was up for grabs. And I have no idea whether we were completely wrong, but it was always reported they might be slightly ahead of us in the vote count. But we always went through it and we said we thought we were in really good shape. And upon leaving New York, we really thought we were now up to 14, 15, maybe 16 votes. And as we headed into Houston, we really thought we had between 18 and 19 votes when we counted. But it's really hard. I mean, if you call someone up on the phone and you say, are you going to vote for us? They're not going to say, no, I hate you guys. And I'll never <laughs> vote for you. And you know, it's really difficult when these are people you compete against, their partners. And it was a really difficult position for the owners. So we went ahead and said, all right, we're going to go to Houston. And we're going to show you exactly why this project makes the most sense. And, and so we'll jump ahead to where this project is. And this is a slide that. Basically, we came up with in Chicago to try to show what our building would look like at night. And you know, much of the question wrestled around for, for four months in 2014. It was, do we put a roof on this stadium or not? Do you need a roof in Los Angeles, or is that crazy? And especially when you figure out the cost of the roof is roughly $400 million, $500 million. <laughs> it becomes even crazier. 
and, and I will tell you, I started off in the no roof camp. So, um, but maybe I was looking at the dollars. But eventually, we came to the belief that to do this kind of project in Los Angeles, had to be able to host every kind of event under the sun. NFL, Super Bowl, Final Four, NBA All-Star Game, uh, now the Olympics. Uh, and, and while, you know, let's just face it, we're not the hardiest of souls who grew up here or live here. <laughs> and how many people are going to go sit in the rain at an NFL game in Los Angeles, right? <laughs> Show of hands, you know, you know, pretty low. And we got a couple in the back. <laughs> maybe two out of this room, which is about what I thought it, it would be. And you know, so we said, how do we come up with an open air building that is covered? And what you see uh, here is the first of its kind, which is a stadium that has a, uh, what we call an ETFE roof, clear windshield roof, but this building has no walls. So it's a completely open air stadium on the side, but it's covered from all the elements, so when you come and buy a very expensive PSL in our new building, um, <laughs> you will be completely covered uh, and, and you will have open air. But what we showed here was this is what this would look like. If you were flying in LAX, this is what this building would look like lit up on an NFL stadium. And, and we started a long time ago with trying to understand the NFL, if you look, there was a memo in June of 2012 that Commissioner Goodell wrote to all the teams which basically outlined the process for going to Los Angeles. An iconic two-team building with a sports and entertainment district as a result. And really, that is what we focused on. And that was Stan's mantra from the begin beginning. How do we deliver this to the NFL and make sure that it, it comes to fruition? And so we really centered around this was what we always pitched to the owners, which was an iconic stadium design that was authentically LA, open air, that this is a stadium that did not look like it could be built anywhere else in the world, but was truly an LA stadium, that the NFL would grab a hold of and say, this is a flagship project where we can hold Super Bowl, Pro Bowl, draft, every other NFL event, and truly was the gateway to the world. As you look at the NFL expansion, you know, a lot has been made. We are four miles east of LAX. I'm sure many of you fly over our site and check out the bulldozing work that goes on on a daily basis. Those who are not for our project seem to make it a problem at every turn. Uh, sh they shall remain nameless, but I think we all know uh, who they are. Um, but we always looked at it as 38 million people flying to LAX each year, 12 million internationally. This is one of the largest international airports in the world. And the first thing people will see when they land in Los Angeles is the NFL. They'll see this stadium. And that's a terrific opportunity if you're trying to grow your brand to Mexico and to Asia. I don't need to show you guys where Hollywood Park is, but <laughs> let's face it, most of the owners had no clue when we started this process <laughs> where, where it was. But the one thing we told the owners was, while we thought Hollywood Park was the most geographically centered site in, in Los Angeles, it was also really important strategically to the NFL. And so if you look at this slide, we estimated that 40% of the NFL's national revenue was within a five-mile drive of our stadium. Pretty hefty number. And if you want to be centered, you know, you look at DirecTV, EA Sports, Snapchat, Yahoo did the first streaming game. NFL Network is four miles away. Fox, CBS, this is where the NFL is headed. Online, digital, television. And that if you wanted to really think about being the epicenter of the NFL and be a flagship project, you wanted to be centered near Silicon Beach, Playa Vista, in that whole area. And it was really a chance for them to understand not only is this centrally located, but it was important strategically. I keep wondering why on earth we put Tesla on this slide. <laughs> <laughs> but we were looking for cool companies, and we did it. And so it really has nothing to do with what we do. <laughs> And so the one thing we always told the NFL as we went through this process, and I can repeat this in my sleep over and over again, is this is not a one-team stadium. It is not a two-team stadium. It's a 32-team NFL campus. And really, if the NFL was to take full advantage of Los Angeles, they all had to take ownership of what this is going to become. So we had a campus that would have NFL network and offices, all kinds of NFL opportunities. A 70,000 is now a 70,240-seat stadium. At 3 million square feet, it's the largest building in the NFL. Uh, 11 acres covered 
We also have a 6,000 seat theater attached to our stadium, uh, which we can use for concerts and other events in a, in a district that goes with it. And really, this was a slide we first showed in April last year to explain to the NFL how we looked at the world, which was we could go do this real estate project. And you have to understand, Hollywood Park, when you talk about 300 acres, it's bigger than all of Century City's footprint. And if you think about it, it's bigger than Vatican City. And for those who spend time in New York, it is basically Central Park to the Empire State Building all the way to the river on the east side. That's how big this property is. And so when you walk and you tell the NFL that, how do you take advantage? You put the NFL at the heart of this project and you go deliver it. And so this is a slide we showed in April. And truly, Houston was like a greatest hits album of all of our presentations as we went to go put it together. But we always thought this was important, that whatever we did on this project, the NFL would always be at the center. And we told them this essentially laid out like a theme park, that we were going to add to the theme park environment in Los Angeles. And this is the way if you got a map to Hollywood Park and to the 300 acres it would look. And you would see the NFL, the theater could host NFL honors, the NFL draft. Uh, we'd have, we have two hotels entitled on the property, which we could make Marriott hotels because we have a good partner there. Uh, we could do an NFL pro shop, we could do the NFL experience, we could do NFL network next to the stadium. Essentially, that when you walked on this campus, you would look and see and feel the NFL. And the one thing, if you go through this, we never, the video you showed, which had Rams logos, were the only Rams logos we showed in the entire process. This was always about the NFL and what could be done. Here you see the NFL network just to the west. Uh, we always envision, right now, there's Dave, I saw you somewhere, cramped in to a tiny headquarters in Culver City. This is a shiny new building with a kind of 30 Rock Today Show feel right next to the stadium so you could activate. Uh, really trying to play to what would appeal to all 32 owners because look, quite frankly, they weren't looking to make the Rams richer. They weren't looking to make Stan richer. You know, they were looking for a project that would work for everybody. And you always had to appeal to all 32, not just to, to what it would mean for us. We mocked this up. This is the performance venue, what the NFL draft would look like in 2019. Uh, we took some liberty and put Todd Gurley on the wall. Um, <laughs> This was before he was Rookie of the Year, um, but what was great, and kind of what the draft would look like, but for the first time the NFL could host the draft in a building that it owned and ran, and what that would look like on its campus. And we walked the owners through you know, really what an NFL draft on this project, having 80,000 in the stadium, activating in the theater, having the players stay in the hotel, using NFL Network, what all that would look like for them and how it would come to be. And then this is, this is actually a great story. This is a hotel in Dallas that HKS never developed. But as we're getting ready for our August presentation, I'm like, I need a hotel mocked up to look like the NFL. And this is like 48 hours before the presentation. And it needs to look like anything that would fit on our campus. So this was, a, I believe, a project at Turtle Creek in Dallas that, that never got built. Um, so we slapped a logo on it, slapped a Marriott logo on it, and <laughs> you got an NFL hotel that looks actually like it, it belongs. So you know, we showed them that. But it gets down to. This is really the stadium and in this project, this is the stadium looking from the south and you get the first idea of what a stadium with no walls looks like, covered across the lake, 25 acres of, of parks. My daughter still thinks this is a swimming pool um, <laughs> and, and always asks when she can go swimming. It's a retention pond for Hollywood Park. I would not advise swimming in it uh, <laughs> at all. But you get a glimpse into what it looks like to, to have a stadium, no walls, open to the outside and really kind of what this would mean from a park-like aspect. And then you get inside the stadium. This is what the stadium looks like inside. Uh, if you want to know how much these seats cost, I'll be glad to tell you. Uh, but alumni discount. <laughs> yeah. In terms of the alumni discount, I'll be truly honest, right? The stadium opens in 2019. My daughter's applying for Harvard Westlake in 2019. <laughs> well, we'll see what the discount looks like. <laughs> but this gives you a sense of what the stadium looks like inside. Uh, seven levels of suites, uh, eight levels in the stadium. And so when you look at it, 70,240 seats, 274 suites uh, in the building, 16,000 club seats, 
So basically a truly premium experience as you look around. The building's completely digital. There's not one fixed signage in the building. So it flips very easily for one team. Two teams, if you look at the, the ring scoreboard, it's double-sided. So there's different programming on each side. So if you want to watch the out-of-town games and NFL Red Zone on one side and the stadium programming on the other, you'll be able to do that. Uh, for those in the upper deck, if you look out, that's the south end zone from this side, which is the east. You'll be able to look out to the ocean. From the west side in the upper deck, you'll be able to see the Hollywood sign out the other vision. So this is really what the stadium comes to life and looks at. And you can still see we, we've never really changed the generic Los Angeles. The team was navy and gold a little bit that we were playing with. But this is essentially the stadium. As you look at you have an ETFE roof, so it's clear. Uh, it is actually four degrees cooler in this building on a sunny day than if you were just outside, uh, but warmer if it's covered. But this is what the inside of the stadium essentially looks like. If you're looking, everybody talks about parking. This was a large topic uh, throughout the process. How many parking spaces are you going to have? 12,675 spaces, uh, which, and then 32,000 spaces within a mile. We're trying to buy more land to get more parking. So if you own that land, again, alumni discount this way. Uh, <laughs> we'd, be, we'd be glad to buy it. This is really a, a map of the surface parking uh, within the project and getting a sense of where it comes in. This is a view from a VIP parking lot. If you're parking in this, you're probably going to pay about 100 bucks a game. So this is what it will look like. I, I kid, it's probably 95. Um, <laughs> but this is a view in from, from an up close parking lot at night of what comes into the stadium. Uh, I have no idea how these pictures snuck in. This is not the player drop off, judging by the cars. Um, but there are two VIP valet drop off spots, and then there are 200 spaces underneath the building uh, if you're truly a VIP to come in and leave your car. This is the approach from the form as you walk in through the parking lot um, from the northwest and what it looks like to walk up on the stadium. And as you get close to the stadium, you can see under truly what this will mean to have no walls, right? So basically, you walk into this stadium on the sixth level, which is general admission. The stadium is sunk into the ground, so basically most of it happens underground. So if you have a ticket, a normal ticket, you're walking right in to your seat level. You don't have to go up or down and through it. And basically, it's open. You'll be able to walk in. This is an approach from the south end zone walking in, so basically you're able to walk right in. This is the 11 acre party plaza, which is underneath the roof. So you'll be able to come in and have pregame events. Again, this, you've seen this. That's the performance venue on the right, the stadium kind of on the left. And here you can see, look, in and out of the stadium, no walls, nothing that, that exists. This is the walk from the sixth level up to the eighth level, which is uh, the top deck. It's 40 feet, so it's very easy for people to get in and out of. But you get a sense of completely designed indoor outdoor. This does not look like any other stadium you've ever seen on Earth in terms of the way the landscaping is done, the way you can look in and out. Uh, there's 70,000. You can look on the platforms. There's room for an additional 30,000 standing room only for events. So when you get up to a Super Bowl or, you know, we're actually talking to WWE or any of those other events, you could do 100,000 people uh, in the building for that. This is a suite and club entrance. So as you walk through uh, on the west side of the building, this is what it looks like if you're walking into a suite or club level. Got to have palm trees, right? <laughs> this is that same view as you look back. Um, but it gives a really good idea of what a building without walls looks like. Because you can look straight from the parking lot all the way into to this building as you walk through and, and understand the indoor outdoor. And if you look down here at this bottom, this is one of the main club levels we have. This is the club. Uh, this is our main patio club, which feeds into the second and third level for the stadium. So essentially, it's an indoor outdoor club. It is the greatest patio you've ever sat on. You can walk in and out of the building. So if you look back, you can get a sense down there where this is and what the environment looks like. And basically, we designed this as for those who watch games at home, at halftime, if you want to go walk outside in your backyard, get fresh air, you can go do this. This is a view looking back in from that same club into the stadium. This is one of our clubs. We have 17 different clubs right now in the stadium. So it is designed for every aspect of Los Angeles that you can think of, and even some you don't actually want to know. Right? But, but this is one club. We call this our stage club, which is part of a three-level potential sweeter club. Um, this is what we call our, uh, this is actually 
a loge box for those who don't want a full suite but want smaller suites. This is a loge club uh, that we have. This is what we call our cabana club, which is our highest end field level club where, where you'll be seen and be seen. I'm pretty sure when we talked about this in Chicago, we referenced the Kardashians being in the suite. <laughs> I, I am 95% positive it's the only time their name has ever come up at an NFL meeting, period. <laughs> um, but this is, for those of you who have been to San Francisco, New York, Dallas, and been part of those sideline suites, this is exactly what that looks like here. Uh, this is a, from one of our 274 suites. It's basically, this is probably the most common suite. We'll have five different suite types and finishes in the building. This is the most common one. And it's designed basically as your kitchen. If you want to watch games, that you have a center island that you can go and watch games. You go up to the glass, there are no seats against the glass. All the seats are in the bowl. And basically, you have a media mesh that runs the length of the suite, so you can program it with whatever games, whatever pictures whatever sponsors or messaging you want. I have no idea. The crazy part when you do these things, like the same guys pop up over and over again <laughs> from your generic images, and this guy is everywhere. <laughs> and I actually think this is the same guy, just with, with different clothes. This guy is 400 pictures. Um, as we see, this is a, a suite on the seventh level again common space, the way you would watch a game. Uh, when we started this process, we said, okay, it's LA, how do you get Lakers floor seats? How do you get Dodgers behind home plate seats? So we developed field suites that are pulled out. So this is essentially what we think will be Hollywood A-list and people who want to buy the must-have suite. There are currently 20 field suites uh, for sale. This is the loge box we're talking about with four or five seats, touch screen, digital, everything you'd ever want to watch an entire game fantasy football on. One of the things we're changing in this is completely different concession approach than, than what ever has been done. Essentially a food hall, so if you think of the great food halls in America, the Ferry Building, the one that was just put in downtown, for those who go to New York, Chelsea Market, essentially this whole stadium will be a food hall. And everything we do will be wandering around. You have wood fire pizza, you have sushi upstairs, but not your traditional concession experience, really trying to get the best of LA culinary scene and put it in this building. Here you see what a concession stand actually looks like on one of the club levels, 360 degrees, so you can watch the game. You can see everything made in front of you. This happens to be a bar uh, because if we don't get above seven and nine, people will drink heavily um, throughout our games, which I've noticed. But essentially, the whole process is you don't line up and watch the game and you know have your back to it. That you can still be part of the game, stand there, watch your food be cooked, and have a whole culinary experience. This is an end zone restaurant. Uh, I don't know for those of you who have been to Levi Stadium with the Michael Mina restaurant, we ripped this concept right off from them, um, <laughs> which is what the best of what teams do. But this, that glass, it's in the north end zone. It looks directly on the field. So you'll be able to sit in there, eat during the game, have your own brewery, your own TV, your own controls, and be able to look and watch the game. Next slide is what a concourse in our building looks like. So what we're going to try to do is the first ever completely digital concourse. So this is all on projection. So be able to watch Red Zone. We'll be able to flip sponsors. So if there are two teams in this building, one could have Delta, one could have United, and you'd be able to seamlessly change out from day to day. Uh, you can tell we were trying to you know, curry favor with some different owners here. Jim Irsay, <laughs> Arthur Blank, Jimmy Haslam, John Mara. Uh, and again, Todd Gurley, just because why not? Uh, but essentially, everything in this building, as you look, is digital. The first completely digital building ever in the NFL. This is our locker room. It's the only place you'll see a logo. Uh, we showed this because we'd say our locker room is identical to the second team that's going to come in. Unfortunately, you can tell when these mock-ups were done, because if you look at our cuts recently, a lot of the same numbers that are on our cuts are on here. So. That's just a coincidence. That and Tavon Austin grew by about three feet. <laughs> you don't need to go through economics. It costs a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> we showed this picture. This is uh, from the LA Times tour. This is the 50-yard line, this yellow, yellow stake. We showed this here. Uh, if you're looking north, that's looking basically north towards Manchester. Uh, from the south, those trees are the north end zone um, and where we we plan to be quite often. 
uh, off NFL Network, if you're looking, is right up here at the south, and the rest of the project is to the behind of us. If you go through, this is the current construction as of January, so if you're flying in, this is exactly what it looks like, and that's the entitled plan. So we're in currently entitled for eight and a half million square feet of development on this project. Uh, a million square feet of retail, another million square feet of office. If any of you are looking to relocate to Inglewood, we'd be happy to talk to you about office space. Um, hotels go right here, the rest of the project. This is all the second phase, which we're entitled for 1,500 townhomes you know, or houses, which will come online after the fact. But this is essentially the entitled plan. We have the right to add another 5 million square feet to get up to 13 and a half million square feet of development over time as long as we petition. So this is essentially what it looks like now to what it looks like then. And this was designed to show how far along we actually were in the construction plan. As we got to the end of this process, we always wanted to try to impress upon people what we knew, that the Rams were the most popular team in Los Angeles. And how could people go through and begin to understand that? And so Bill Plaschke uh, wrote this article uh, on January 7th of 2015, basically talking about the Rams as Los Angeles' first love. <coughs> a year later, he wrote a different quote talking about how the Rams would be welcome home. And we were fortunate enough, this is the fan rally that they had at the Coliseum two days before the presentation. We wanted to give people a sense of just how popular the Rams were in the NFL and what a fan base was ready to be activated. And so this was fantastic timing. Uh, so we were busy late at night trying to rip these photos off the internet. <laughs> and then this was the same view coming the other way of our stadium. And so there you see the presentation that, that we gave in Houston. It was a little more polished, a little more practiced uh, when we did it in Houston. But the goal was to show them what this project could become, how transformative it would be Los Angeles, and the passion that Los Angeles has for, for the Rams. And we were thrilled that the owners agreed with our vision and what it could become, and they entrusted us with this terrific opportunity to go and make Los Angeles truly an NFL destination. So now you guys are the first to have seen why the NFL chose us, and we were very fortunate. Stan had the vision and the means to put this together and trusted a lot of people who could come together and build this project. And when we talk about 200 people every day for two years, that's what this was. And while people have talked about the presentation, I think you can tell from the renderings, Charlie Chaplin could have stood up here and scrolled through this and made sure that this came to fruition. And it was great that they, they saw our vision and what it could become. But I've done this presentation. I don't want to say I'm bored of it, but <laughs> it's accomplished its means. But want to leave plenty of time for you guys to ask whatever questions you have. Uh, also happy to talk about football. Should anybody ever want to talk about that topic? Um, and, and we'll go ahead and have some fun and let you guys ask whatever you want. fortunate. Jerry was one of the first people to recognize the vision of this project and, and what it could become and was one of our champions from the very beginning and I, I think really for us was someone we could always lean on in this process to help the NFL envision 
what this opportunity can become. And, and there are a lot of great Jerry Jones stories, none of which can be shared in here um, <laughs> as we go through this process. But I remember vividly when we presented in Chicago, Jerry stood up and basically said, this is your project. This is your guy. We need to get this done. And he was always one of our best champions. And I think the one reason we always looked at Jerry was he was an owner who attempted this project. He built a stadium just like this. We hired his architects. This is his kind of vision. And the only building this really compares to right now in the NFL is his stadium. And he was the one who, who risked himself to go to build that. And really, we copied a lot of that blueprint. And we would not be standing here if it were not for Jerry Jones and his passion for this project. But the one thing Jerry really did is he was the first person on board of what eventually became a pretty broad coalition of owners who understood what this could mean for the NFL. And I think Jerry was great about selling this when we didn't necessarily feel comfortable selling it ourselves to other owners because of the dynamics. Jerry was right there you know, to pick up and talk. And one of the great memories I have in October, you know, essentially in August we got to present and then they started this process where they kicked the three teams out of the room and they talk about us behind our backs for the next two hours. And, and so in October, basically, and there was a meeting in New York, and Jerry got up, and from what I understood, he talked for about 30 minutes, and as described to me, just basically filibustered the whole time. And <laughs> that it was scheduled to be about 30 minutes, and everybody just found themselves nodding in agreement to what Jerry was saying, and, and that, that was that. And, and this would not have happened you know, without Jerry being influential and seeing the vision of what we were doing. I, I think you know, the committee's job and I blocked out the committee vote of 5-1. Um, it happened in a very short span. I think the committee's job was to understand all the dynamics of play and to make sure that a process was followed. And I think the committee did a very good job of where they started in September of 2014 to getting it to a point now where all the NFL is excited about this project. And what I was always worried about at the very end uh, was that this would be a very divisive process. That no matter who was chosen at the end, the NFL would not rally around a project, and I think the committee did a great job of bringing this to a conclusion along with the other owners. So the point now where everybody in the NFL is really excited about Inglewood, about the opportunity us and the Chargers have to go play there, and what this can mean for the NFL and really bringing people together, and I give the committee a ton of credit for that. Kevin, uh, David Silverman, class of 1980, and uh, from the bottom of my heart, thank you. And I think everybody in this room says a big thank you to you and to all of your efforts. And as a longtime Ram fan and moving on in the future, can you talk a little bit about the sense of family that you've tried in the past with St. Louis and bringing in the parents of the players and a sense of community and where you see uh, this transitioning to Los Angeles uh, in, uh, in the near future? Well, I think one of the things, the answer won't be that bad, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> but. You know, we're fortunate with, with Jeff Fisher and Les Need to have two really good individuals. We've been the youngest team in the NFL for four straight years. I am desperate to sign any of you in here to be a long snapper so we can ultimately not be the youngest team in, in the NFL again. But uh, one of the things they embedded is how do we go take talented players and raise them in the Rams way? And through that, we've been fortunate enough to bring parents in after the draft, really build a family process and grow this team together. It's something that we could have, and we always targeted when Jeff and Les came in in 2012 that we would go build this to be a great team whenever we open a stadium in St. Louis and Los Angeles. And really, now that team's coming into its prime. It hasn't shown yet on the field, but we're pretty close. But I, I think the sense of, you know, we have a terrific organization. What I'm proud about this process is the NFL, you know, when you're in a smaller market, when you're not a great record on the field, when you play in not a great building, they don't always tend to view you you know, is at the forefront of what you're doing. I think through this process, the NFL took a deeper look at our organization and came away somewhat impressed with what we had, especially on the player side and in the vision side. And look, when you, I can't give enough credit. We're, we're fortunate we come to LA with back-to-back -back rookies of the year and Aaron Donald and Todd Gurley. It's a great credit to our team, you know, to our scouting staff, what we're trying to do. And we're gonna try to make it three for three next month here in April. Uh, I am not looking for any more. I'm, I'm good with 298. But I think as we go to look and working with the city of Inglewood and what it can become, uh, we hope that this is the spur for development throughout the neighborhood and what it can become. The city actually 
has looked at a number of pieces of land they may acquire for whether it can come on to parking or, or some other further development. So I think from that perspective, we're always looking. I'm not in the real estate business. I'm happy to get out of it uh, at this point. I've spent too much time in, in the past two years. We are looking, we are gonna build a training facility. Uh, we're looking to do a kind of mini Inglewood uh, for a training facility. We're looking out actually in the valley to go do that as if we don't have enough to do with 300 acres, what's another 60 or 70 to go go develop. But I think from that perspective, you know, from Stan, he's always looking. And, and I'm just happy to follow that lead. <coughs> Tell me you're not a St. Louis plant, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, the, the PSLs in St. Louis ran for the length of the lease. And so when those expired, when the lease got terminated in St. Louis, the PSLs that went with it, you know, stopped. And in the St. Louis, the process was in the new stadium there, they were banking on PSL money as well. So however you're going to build this, this is going to be a, a start of the PSL process. But just ignore the 600 million number. I tried to scroll through that really quickly. <laughs> and, uh, and, and it's probably going to be higher than that. So if we do our job right, we'll, we'll get above that number. That's what that we based it up with the 49ers did at, at Levi's. Kevin, talk about San Diego and options. And uh, I will not talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> I have no offense. Any, you know, we're fortunate the Chargers have the right to come join us this year. Uh, they're working through their own process in San Diego. We have an agreement with them uh, to come into the stadium. They can come join us. Uh, I think they're targeting a vote at some point this year on their stadium project down there. If they win, they'll stay. And if they stay, then the Raiders have the right to come join us. But hopefully by the end of this year, we'll have a pretty good idea of whether you know, this is a two-team building. We would love to have the Chargers come join. It's been a very interesting process working with them now to try to understand you know, what can be done and how we figure this out. And for us, getting an additional 10 dates in the building would be great. Um, two questions. The first is, you guys pitched it to the two-team stadium. What are the ramifications for the consumer? Can they finish it? Can you that second game? And then the second question is, who's your favorite to be? I'll answer the first second. My favorite free agent quarterback is Case Keenum. Um, <laughs> and he's a restricted free agent, but it counts. Um, and you know, and I, I think in terms of the consumer, look, if there are two teams, there are more choices uh, for fans. And if you look at the data, 50% of NFL fans in Los Angeles are team agnostic of which team they wanted to come. And I think for us, we've seen you know, that data and we've seen the overwhelming support. We've had 56,000 deposits to come join us. Uh, a ton of support for the Rams, and we think this is a very Rams friendly market. Obviously, there's, if you look at every other league here, there's two teams. And so I think there's plenty of space for a second team to join. I think there will be more choice for people if there are two teams. I don't think it really will change the economics for the consumer, one team you know, versus two teams. I just think it's a completely different audience and hopefully a wider audience you know, if you look at the Chargers. But I, our goal on this is to make it you know, as fan friendly as possible, as consumer friendly as possible, while still trying to cover. $2.6 billion. So that's what, what keeps me up in the way in the back. Thanks, Jared Berry, 94. Um, in terms of your career path, you went right into the, you went to the Avengers, I think, and then you went to the Bucks, and now. So what would you either recommend, or how did you choose that? Or did you, in, at Harvard Westlake, were you saying, I want to be part of a professional sports team? How did you get into that? I wouldn't recommend it. That, <laughs> certainly certainly not, not, not the first and foremost. I, I think one of the great things, I was fortunate, you know, I graduated from college in 1999, I did what everybody else did, I went to work on the internet. I quickly left the internet um, and went to go work on the team side with Casey and the Avengers and had a great chance to go learn, make a ton of mistakes that nobody ever learned. Was fortunate enough then to be able to go back to business school and make the jump to, to the NFL. Uh, I think there are lots of opportunities into the team world. I just think it's a different life if you're looking for it and what it is. And you have to find the passion. I always tell people, you know, people always ask, you know, I want to get into sports, I'll do anything. And I always tell them, you know, I always equate it to music. If you love rap music and someone says, I'll hire you to edit Sony Classical, you don't want to get into music, you want to get into rap. 
I think in sports, I always look at it, you want to get in the sport that you love the most because it is grueling the hours you work. Uh, it is underpaid, uh, underappreciated, and there are a thousand people who are willing to take your job at a moment's notice. And so I think when you're looking to get into sports, you have to love what you do every day. But I was, the NFL is a drug. You know, on Sundays when you're standing on that field, no matter how bad the week has been, you know, it is great, but it takes unbelievable emotional intelligence. When, you, when we beat the Seahawks in overtime week one this year, you walk into our building, it was the best building, probably the best experience on Monday morning. You walked in the, the Monday morning after Sam Bradford tore his ACL in 2014 and we knew we were toast. You know, and trying to rally your staff, it's impossible. And I think you have to understand that you know, most jobs don't have the highs and lows of sports. And you have to come to, to understand those, work through those. And I think what fans experience is exactly what staff experiences. And so you go through and you, you try to understand that. You know, whether Harvard Westlake prepared me for this, I, yes, of course, right? <laughs> Oh. <laughs> although, although I always say, I, I now manage a salary cap and put together these numbers, and I never took as much as pre-calculus at Harvard-Westlake. <laughs> and I actually took easy math senior year. I took tri trigonometry. <laughs> oh. so, so truly, you can fake your way through anything <laughs> in life. But you know, I, I always think in this, people know whether or not deep down you want to work in sports. And at some point you have to say, am I a fan or am I willing to live this every day? And because, look, at the end of the day, it's still a job. And when you're going through this process, it was absolutely a job. And you know, as my wife here will, will attest to you, there was a day in November I came home, we're on a four game losing streak. Uh, we just had a player, unfortunately, who was shot in Miami. Uh, our quarterback, the most important free agent quarterback, Case Keenum, had just suffered a concussion in Baltimore, of which Somehow he, he managed to play a play after he had the concussion. Uh, we're in the middle of this process. The FAA was announcing they were going to cancel our stadium. And, and we're in the middle of a four game losing streak. And I came home and told my wife, like, this job's supposed to be fun. Like, this job is not fun today. <laughs> and then we went on a three game winning streak. Case was healthy. Uh, Stedman is fine and recovered well. We won this project. I'm like, this job's a lot of fun. <laughs> right? So I, I think you just. You have to, if you want to get into sports, you have to get into whether or not you're willing to go through the ups and downs and whether you're willing to trade being a fan versus having this be your life every day, which is very different. I'm happy to take as many as people want. It's up to you guys how long you want to stay. Uh, the challenges of the Coliseum will, will be interesting, and we're trying to understand exactly what those are. We came to a game in October and walked around and kind of did a test understanding. And what's fascinating about the Coliseum is it has significant challenges, just as the Rose Bowl would have. What's really neat for 2019 is that's the best football experience Los Angeles knows over time. And so when you walk around the Coliseum, you're like, oh my god, how are we going to play here? And then you're like, these people will pay anything to come into our new stadium. It's like, great. <laughs> so, you know, I, I think when, when you walk through that, you know, the Coliseum will not have the bells and whistles of a modern NFL stadium. It does not have premium, you know, and, and you realize you've raised really spoiled children when the hardest part about playing in the Coliseum is explaining to your daughter that you don't actually have a box and she's going to have to sit in the stands and she's going to have to deal with that <laughs> overall. And she asks if she still has to go to games, if that's the case. So, but, I, you know, I think the nice thing is people know where the Coliseum is, they know the football experience, they're used to it, and they understand it's a means to an end. Um, and our job is if we put a good enough product on the field the next three years and get people excited about that stadium, that it will go by very quickly. And, but that's what people here are used to. And if you look at Los Angeles, which is very strange, soccer aside, Staples Center is the newest stadium built here, just over 20 years old. Dodger Stadium is now the third oldest stadium in baseball, you know, Anaheim Stadium is well behind that. This is not a place that has modern stadiums. Pauly's just been redone. But I think if you start to understand what this opportunity is, it's not a city that's actually accustomed to great stadiums. You look at New York, which went through the building boom of Citi Field and Yankee Stadium and MSG being redone and Jets Giants building MetLife together. All of a sudden, all of this premium came onto line together. We're really the only building, you know, along with LAFC coming online. So I think. People will navigate through the Coliseum 
and hopefully we'll convince them pretty soon that this opportunity is unbelievable. Uh, I, I, Casey and I chatted throughout this process and he said, well, if you win, it would be fantastic. Um, and then he asked if we could donate to LA 2024. And, <laughs> which I said we would do, but I just made a $2.5 billion donation. Um, I, I think this is one of the great things about this is you look at the Olympic movement and you look at what you know, LA and, and Casey and his group have done has shown what a terrific city Los Angeles is and the fact that that Stan would come here and make a two and a half billion dollar bet on Los Angeles to the private stadium, I think shows what this community can be and what a great sports environment it will be in. And we've told you know, the Olympic group that we're willing to help out in any way as possible. We have a lot of great ideas. One of the great things, because this building has a roof, it can host almost any event that the Olympics has, uh, which makes it a really dynamic building for the Olympics and what they're trying to do. But I would say we're gonna leave it up to them what they want to host in 2024, and we're happy to go along with it. about this building and just the way it's designed. It's only above ground level, it's only 150 feet. So if you're in Englewood and you're on the bluffs overlooking it, it will not be this gigantic spaceship dropped into the neighborhood that people look at. And I think when you look at the form, the revitalization, you look at this, the ability to bring foot traffic into Englewood, the ability to bring revenue, and a lot of what we do importantly for our team is get involved in the community. Uh, we're looking at hosting our first place 60 event. Uh, in Inglewood sometime this spring, getting involved in the community, making a difference there, and taking the benefits of having the NFL come. But also, I think what you look at for us overall is how this project can deliver jobs, opportunity, and really revenue into the city, and also provide, instead of people driving to LA Live or the Grove or somewhere else, that people will be able in their own communities to have a retail center, dining options, this stadium, a number of community events and festivals and fairs, high school graduations on this campus so they can make it their own. I think really it's going to be a balance of how you make sure that Englewood feels like they have ownership with this while embedding it in the greater Los Angeles community. But uh, Mayor Butts has been a, a terrific partner uh, throughout this. He's a unique individual um, who, who has helped shepherd this but has such a passion. And, and look, this project would not have happened without Englewood Mayor Butts, the city council, and the terrific support of that community coming out and rallying behind this. And, and we have to make sure that we reward them with a project that's sensitive and incorporates their needs and doesn't overtake them. <coughs> so two things. One, our PSL division of road teams, and two, we need to promote code DevOps, what I just you need to use promo code CRONKY to get 50 yard line seats. Um, DEMOF will get you somewhere in the end zone. Uh, and I, I think in terms of the PSLs, if there are two teams, they'll each sell their own PSLs. Now there will be some PSLs that can be sold jointly together the way you know, Premier seats are at Staples or the way Senate seats used to be. There will be some product, but we'll sell separately to do that. I love these hands. So there's obviously a huge conversation. <coughs> So sustainability, we had a ton of talks about it. This building will be LEED certified. What level it comes into, we're not sure. If you go back and you see all the vegetation and the landscaping throughout, it was all designed that along with the retention pond. One of the great things about this building, because it's open air, is it doesn't have to be, there is no HVAC system within the building. So basically it self cools, it self heats, which saves a ton of energy. You know, as we look at this, you know, one of the most fascinating things, this is gonna be the first stadium designed in what we call the Uber time. So having what we call Uber lanes and managing for people to come in and out of the game without just driving on their own. The Metro stop is gonna be 0.9 miles uh, from this building and we're hopeful if the Olympics come to Los Angeles we can get a spur down to our building so that people can take the Metro. And if you look at USC right now, their ridership's up about 25% on game day. So sustainability is a huge part of it. It's a huge part from the food aspect, from there's 25 acres of the 300 is all green space and parks and 
and lakes and ponds and walking trails for the houses. So a, a very large part of it, because I don't think you can do this project in, in Los Angeles without of it. I will say it has not been my first focus, um, but our landscape group, our architects, they talk about it all the time and, and are happy to do so. so. You know, I will say we have a lot of freedoms of our own that we're trying to resign. We always planned when we started this process that with the youngest team in the NFL, when they came up for contracts, we want to be able to resign all of our own. So of our 60 million, almost all of it right now is earmarked for our own guys, and then starting to resign Tavon Austin and Michael Brockers. You know, Aaron Donald, when he comes up, is not going to be cheap, and I don't even have to preface that by saying it because he knows it, I know it, we all know it. But really, most of our money, because we have 60 million this year. Right now, we're scheduled for about 75 million next year. Uh, all of it is so we can re-sign our own guys and then keep drafting, developing, and moving forward. Uh, I will say we've been really crappy in free agency. Uh, I've written a lot of bad deals. You know, we just haven't found a lot of success in free agency, and so I think there's a buyer beware in, in all of that in terms of going out and buying other people's players that we just haven't figured out. Uh, when you get in the second wave, and I will say the one thing. Uh, at the Combine last week, the number of agents who came up to us and said, my guy really wants to play in Los Angeles, and it was a player we had never considered, we plan to take full advantage of that. And, <laughs> and, and so I think what you'll see over the next couple weeks and as free agency starts next week is once the first wave kind of starts, you know, players who are looking for a home who want to be here, uh, we'll be aggressive in going after them and, and trying to get them to come. But I, in terms of other free agents, I wouldn't expect a ton from us. Let's take one more and then we'll did I look at you? <laughs> and I would say you, you never get out of this conversation without a uniform question in, in Los Angeles. And so uh, I, I will answer this way. You should buy a lot of gear of a lot of different. <laughs> when we started this process years ago, we always said when we open a new stadium, we were going to do a complete redesign. I really don't love our current uniforms, but they're what we have. And when we open a new stadium, be it in St. Louis or Los Angeles, that we wanted to do a redesign to go with that. Uh, it is, in the NFL, it's a two-year redesign process. So from the time you submit to redesign, it is a full two years to go through that process. So we, if, and we started that clock basically the minute we were approved for relocation. So we have two years, which will put us into 18. We'll delay it another year to get into 19. So we'll have new uniforms uh, when we open the new stadium. We're going to spend basically the next year taking fan input on what people want to see. Uh, our current throwbacks are what we wore in LA. So I think you will see a lot of those were allowed to wear those twice a year uh, here. So I would expect you will see that. A lot of our advertising is doing using throwback, but we can't wear them more than twice. We've asked the league, can we go to throwbacks permanently in this interim period? They said no, uh, which I understand. Um, people are upset. I get that people want the old Rams colors, not the new colors, but it's just one of those things as we go through this process that we just couldn't change. And it's the least of our fights that that we're willing to do. Plus, let's face it, we want people to be good consumers. Go and buy a current jersey, go and buy a throwback jersey. <laughs> and then when 2019 comes open, there will be a brand new team store in Inglewood, and you can go buy that jersey you know, at the same time. But I, I think our viewpoint is we want to get back to some combination. Of the, I love the blue and whites. I think we're going to try to go back to that at some point. I think we're going to do the blue and yellow in some version. I have a ton of mock-ups that people send us all the time that I keep in a file. Uh, it'll be a fun process with NFL and Nike, but I would expect that you'll see three years of these uniforms and we will move on. But I would not be surprised uh, to see a lot of the throwbacks uh, in 2016 when we can. We did the color rush game uh, this past December in, Los An in St. Louis where we wore all yellow. I think you will see that probably come to fruition on Thursday night again. So. So, which we liked, we won. I only judge uniforms by whether we win or lose, <laughs> which means our current uniforms really suck. But, <laughs> but uh, 
And I think we're four and two in the throwbacks, so I, I keep that one and zero in the color rush, four and two in the throwbacks, and I don't want to know in the other uniforms. Uh, but it would not be a night without a uniform question. But <laughs> expect changes and expect a process. And I really wish I had called upon anybody else. <laughs> <laughs>